So, cosmology must address the infinitesimal as well as the infinite. So let's go to the heart of the matter because, incredibly, mass is undefined. In every textbook and encyclopedia, the amount of mass is confused with the amount of matter, perhaps because they both begin with the letter N. This means that no scientist understands E equals MC squared. This confusion allows particle physicists to talk of creation and annihilation of matter, which is impossible without understanding what matter is. It's not physics. E equals MC squared is simply telling us that, all, that mass is a measure of the amount of energy held in matter. Particles have no mass, we're told. Armed with this ignorance, the standard particle model says subatomic particles have no intrinsic mass, which is nonsense. Are they saying protons and electrons have no rest mass, no energy? It seems so. In the standard particle model, mass is provided externally by a kind of cosmic treacle of imaginary Higgs bosons. The total cost of finding something dubbed the Higgs boson at the Large Hadron Collider ran over $13 billion in July 2012 at a running cost of a billion dollars a year, that makes it more than 17 billion, years, a billion dollars wasted chasing the grin of the Cheshire cat. The LHC operates like smashing countless jumbo jets into mountains and picking over the debris to see how they fly. But the whole is more than the sum of the bits we can see. We are not dealing with closed systems. <coughs> Even worse, it's like asking one of Douglas Adams telephone hygienists to do the investigation. The investigators are not properly trained. Energy is undefined. All you will find in textbooks are examples of different forms of energy. The Big Bang is supposed to have originated from pure energy, which is nonsense when energy only makes sense in relation to matter in motion with respect to all other matter. But matter hasn't been defined in the, any physical sense involving sensible internal movement. The quantum realm is weird. It's admitted by leading physicists that no one understands quantum mechanics. It's incompatible with Einstein's postulate of no instantaneous information transfer and it seems to involve even the experimenter's thoughts in the outcome of some experiments. Once again, any experiment is not a closed system as physicists like to assume. That is why the quantum realm appears weird. Light and the electric force are mysteriously transferred through empty space. We have all experienced the force between two magnets. What's happening in the space between them? The pioneers of electromagnetism knew there has to be a medium to transfer the electric force. They called it the ether. The ether has to be an electrically polarizable medium that fills the universe. In that way you can daisy chain the electric force directly. It's a longitudinal force. And applying the speed of light limit to that makes no sense whatsoever because light is a wave motion. I think I've said before that's like the difference between pulling on a rope and feeling the tug at the other end almost instantly and waving one end of the rope and waiting for the wave to get to the other end. Light is a slow process in the universe. So if we have this ether that fills the universe, space is full. There's no such thing as a perfect vacuum. Einstein knew that there has to be an ether, but his postulates somehow did away with it. He admitted that his theory of relativity would fail if the Earth's motion through the ether were detected. That's because his inertial frames of reference would not be equivalent. It would be like having one observer experiencing a gentle breeze from the ether wind while another might be suffering a howling gale. As it turns out, Dayton Miller repeated the Michelson-Morley ether experiments far more rigorously and at different elevations. He found an ether drift. Sadly, left hemisphere training denied and quickly forgot this fact. So let's have a look at the standard particle model. An atom, once a promise of fundamental simplicity, is really a nucleus within a hazy probabilistic fog of electrons. The nucleus is some protons and neutrons held together by the mysterious short-range nuclear or strong force. 
The particles in the nucleus have a hidden, unknown number of weird, undetectable bits inside. These bits are appearing and disappearing in defiance of a principle of science that miracles are forbidden. Meanwhile, a recent report from the Large Hadron Collider suggests new findings that don't fit this model. Here's a snapshot of a proton by Professor Matthew Strassler. He writes, Imagine all of the quarks, up, down and strange, that is U, D and S, anti-quarks, U, D and S with a bar on top, and gluons, a G, zipping around near the speed of light, banging into each other and appearing and disappearing. <laughs> so a proton is said to be some quarks held together by some gluons which are themselves the quantized manifestations of the strong force. <coughs> there is no mention of how a force manifests as a particle. It gets much worse. A gluon is really one of several colours of gluon, but it also has the simultaneous property of anti-colour. Gluons mediate the interaction between quarks, but they also mediate the interaction between themselves and quarks. That's right, gluons are the strong force, but they also experience the strong force. Happily for the physicists, quarks are unobservable in principle because they only exist inside the nucleon. It's very convenient. <laughs> this is simple. You can forget elegance. This is extreme, narrow, left hemisphere focus on a model with no basic definitions to make sense of the words being used. Andrew Pickering, the author of Constructing Quarks, who did a sociological study of uh, particle physics, and it's an interesting book, says there's no obligation on anyone to take account of what 20th century science has to say. To listen too closely to scientists may be simply to stifle the imagination, that is the right hemisphere. World views are cultural products, there is no need to be intimidated by them. We come to the electric universe model of the atom. The electrically neutral atom is made of charged particles, positive and negative, in equal numbers, together with a number of neutral particles called neutrons, stating the obvious. All subatomic particles are real, with real locations in space, it's not a probabilistic fog. There is a polarizable ether which transmits force and carries electromagnetic waves. The universe is full of an electrically neutral, perfect fluid of neutral particles which passes through atoms and celestial bodies practically as if they weren't there. Neutrinos fit this description. So, the electric universe then defines what it means by energy and mass. Energy is matter in motion relative to the matter in the rest of the universe. It used to be said in relation to the fixed stars. This is not a closed system approach. It is a unifying relational concept first articulated by Ernst Mach. So we define mass. Mass is a measure of particle distortion instead of acceleration in response to the electric forces from all other matter in the universe. It's a bit like pushing a balloon full of water. It will tend to distort rather than move. And it's the same with these orbital systems of uh, electrons and protons and so on. Once again, this conforms with Ernst Mach's principle. Neutrons may not exist in the nucleus. If, uh, if so, only two particles are necessary to build all of the elements. This idea came from Edwin Carle, who I'm pleased to say is here and will be presenting in the breakout room. Uh, and the problem for physicists is how do you hold together all of the positive charges in the nucleus? They should repel one another very powerfully. The repulsion of those positive charged protons should prevent it from forming in the first place. However, atomic nuclei seem to require neutrons for stability. That's because when a radioactive atom nucleus decays, neutral particles are sometimes observed to leave the nucleus and exist for a few minutes before further decaying into an electron and a proton. So it was assumed such a neutral particle ex pre-existed in the nucleus. The what if question wasn't asked, that maybe that wasn't so. 
This is an assumption which still does not explain how the positive nucleus remains cohesive. So a special short-range strong nuclear force was invented, the proliferation of forces and particles. Edwin Cull <coughs> suggested a simpler solution. If the electrons remain as discrete particles in the nucleus, they will tend to arrange themselves to, on average, sit equidistant between the protons. Because the distance between the protons is greater than that between each proton and a neighbouring electron, the attractive electric force between the proton and electron, sorry if this is too fast, will be four times greater than the repulsive force. This simple hypothesis removes the need for an extra strong force within the nucleus. It's much simpler. And then it seems that neutrons are a short-lived metastable resonance of a closely bound proton and electron. This is simple. The electric universe simply proposes structure within structure, a repeated pattern. To understand magnetism and gravity, we must go to the heart of matter, a similar approach to that of André Marie Ampère, Carl Friedrich Gauss, Wilhelm Weber and Walter Ritz, who considered the behaviour of positive and negative charged particles of different mass with great success but were ignored for political reasons. Chiefly, they weren't English, I think. Here's a simple hypothesis. The electron and proton have stable, resonant orbital structures of smaller charged particles. In that case, the positron, that is the antiparticles, and antiproton are mirror particles. They're not antiparticles, they're mirrors. There is no antimatter, no creation or annihilation. But this requires that there be an ether of composite neutral particles of vanishingly small mass, the neutrinos. The neutrinos must be quite complex inside but totally collapsed so that they can accept energy and then become a particle and its mirror. But there's nothing, it, it's just assumed that when these particles seem to disappear that they've annihilated, the matter has disappeared. That's not so. So the ether must be normal matter of vanishingly small mass composed of all the subparticles needed to split into an electron and a positron, for example, when subjected to the appropriate energy, electromagnetic energy. For stability, and this is one of the stumbling blocks, of course, for particle physicists to go this way, is that the electric force must act between the tiny particles within the atom instantly. No speed of light delay. The two stable particles, the electron and the proton, if we assume the neutron is just a, a metastable particle, form 254 stable nucleides plus another 85 metastable, that is radioactive nucleides, for a total of 339. So from this simple resonance systems of structure within structure, we have all of the materials we need to see uh, to make the, what we see in the um, world around us. When those nuclei combine with the requisite number of negative electrons to form atoms and molecules, the possibilities are boundless in the living world. What does this mean? Only a single force is necessary, the powerful, instantaneous electric force. The phenomenal strength of the naked electric force can be judged by the simple illustration in the lower left. This shows that if the charge passing through two 120 watt light bulbs in one second were to be transferred equally to two metal plates, the repulsive force between those plates would equal one million tonnes. So it's critical that the electric force is a balanced force, attractive or repulsive. And these two propositions are the epitome of elegant simplicity, balance. The little diagram there uh, on the left, extreme left at the top, shows the attraction between positive and negative and the repulsion between like uh, particles. There are two forms of the electric force uh, that we experience. One is the electrostatic, where you have separated charge some distance apart and the electric dipole where the distance between the two charges becomes so small that the field is altered and you get a different effect called the dipole field. So it just depends on the degree of separation of a positive and negative charge. It's a difference in scale. 
On our scale, we experience the dipole field of atomic electric fields and subatomic electric fields in the form of magnetism and gravity. They are dipole fields. So both forms of the electrostatic and the dipole field occur between atoms and is responsible for chemistry. The E force operates between all of the particles and subparticles within each atom. In close proximity, this can result in distortion of the atoms to form electric dipoles themselves, which can result in attraction to form a molecule. Or they may enter a new resonant dance by sharing an electron as chemistry. The dipole distorting action on electrons and protons produces dipolar magnetism. The diagram there is actually, uh, I made a mistake, the positive and negative on the left and right should be reversed. But this just shows that if you, let's try this thing here, if you have an electric field operating on a particle here, charged particle here, and accelerating it, and on the opposite side decelerating it, the result will be an elliptical orbit with the nucleus at one of the focuses. And the result of this is that you get a transverse dipole and that transverse dipole is shown there as the magnetic force because if you have two current carrying wires where the electric field in the wire is causing this distortion in electrons then the dipoles are aligned so that they tend to attract and we know that current flowing down two wires in the same direction attract and the opposite way they repel. Okay, so, and the other thing is that I mentioned there, ultra-weak dipolar gravity. And this is the diagram of what happens to an atom in that case. The gravitational field cannot be shielded from, so the gravitational force operates on the heavy nucleus so that it falls towards one of the focuses of an ellipse. This time it's oriented radially uh, towards the surface of the body. But the interesting thing about that is that once you've said that, this means that a body like the Earth and the Moon, which I've shown here, the negative poles on both bodies are facing outwards, which means they're repelling one another. So it means that the, it's long-range repulsive, short-range attractive. We on the surface of the Earth are like iron filings. We don't care which magnet we go to, just the nearest one will do. The gravitational mass of the distant galaxies had a fundamental influence over the motion of the bodies uh, in the solar system. And this is actually shown by precession of the perihelion of the planets, which is tied to the distant stars and not to uh, the sun or general relativity, because general relativity doesn't have a reference frame like that. Short-term changes in the Earth's magnetic field that occur over periods of just years or decades have now been shown in new research to have a very close relationship with changes in gravity. The two are very similar, similar forces. There is no gravitational collapse in space, no black hole swallowing everything. It is the electromagnetic force alone that coalesces matter in deep space. So the assumption that gravity was the controlling force on the large scale is incorrect. There is no need for a big bang to separate everything initially. Gravity is a balanced force like magnetism and cannot form neutron stars or other fanciful supercondensed celestial objects. A planet's gravity is established at its birth by powerful electromagnetic forces. And once the body is formed and the charge on the surface is established, the gravitational field is set by both the surface charge and the initial um, coalescence by electromagnetic forces. So the, the outcome of all that is that all matter in the local universe is connected by the electric force instantly. That's Marx's principle. The origin of mass and quantum spooky connection. Because this force is instantaneous, the so-called entanglement and non-locality suddenly has a simple explanation. And energy is a measure of motion with respect to the matter in the rest of the universe. 
mass is a measure of the energy stored in the orbital motion inside a particle. And simultaneity means there is a universal time and three-dimensional space. We return to the sanity and simplicity of classical physics. These matter resonances are interesting too because having an orbital structure allows ins resonant instantaneous connections and complex interactions which explains weird quantum behaviour. The important thing is that the electron and proton have an orbital charge structure like atoms which explains their internal energy and their magnetic moment. And distortion in an electric field appears as an increase in mass rather than acceleration. Quantum tunnelling in transistors, electrons face a barrier like the illustration in the diagram. It's like having to carry a weight over a hill. But in a weird quantum phenomenon called tunnelling, the electron passes through the barrier as if there's a tunnel. The electric universe model of the electron and proton, having an orbital structure of cha oppositely charged particles, uh, allows us to see that the hill or the repulsive electrical force between similar charges can instantly disappear or become a downhill race. The reason is that the force between two similar particles can become attractive instead of repulsive if you get the particles together at just the right moment. In chemistry, this resonance is achieved by the use of a heavy metal catalyst, which has numerous internal subatomic resonances. The same catalytic process is available, in my opinion, for nuclear fusion. So-called warm fusion is possible by nuclear chemistry catalyzing the nuclei to attract instead of repel. So catalytic chemistry is possible, in my opinion, in the photospheric plasma of all bright stars, where the nuclei are separated from the electrons and can actually come close together in the presence of the heavy elements we see in the spectrum. And you've got to ask the question then, is this the path to future power, like the sun? but only unlike the sun that is believed by present science. In this way, all stars generate the heavy elements in their photospheres where we detect them in their spectra. Rare exploding supernovae are the most ineffectual production means imaginable, because having produced it, you then disperse it into deep space. There's also an unsuspected resonant means of connection in living systems the morphic field of Robert Sheldrake, the mind-body connection, consciousness, subtle energies. The electric universe model explains biological transmutations at body temperature as demonstrated by Dr. Louis Kervran. His is a clear demonstration of this simple process. Is light a wave or a particle? If so, what's waving? Einstein did away with a medium to wave. Or is light a particle? A photon. It can't be both a wave and a particle. You'll notice they've <laughs> merely mouthed a term there. It's particle-like, they're saying. It's a meaningless use of language. If so, according to Einstein, to travel at the speed of light, it must have zero mass. But a particle of zero mass has no energy. You can't multiply zero by infinity and get a real number. And if it's got zero mass, it can't be affected by gravity, so there can be no gravitational lensing. Lensing occurs as a simple atmospheric diffraction effect in the ether. It's like a, an atmosphere around the body. Evidence from stars at the galactic center show no gravitational lensing as expected from standard theory. Clearly, we depend on light to observe the universe, but we don't understand light. Photons don't exist. Light is a transverse electrical disturbance in the ether. And the ether must be a dielectric medium to transfer an electrical disturbance. The wave carries energy through the medium catch up here and the energy is absorbed by the first atom that is in instantaneous resonance with the sending atom 
it gives the appearance that a photon has travelled between the sender and the receiver. It's appearance only. Talking about light brings us to cosmological redshift. Hubble found the fainter and smaller a galaxy appeared, the higher was its redshift. In the diagram, you can see the spectral lines of hydrogen move progressively to the red end of the spectrum uh, as the distance is thought to increase. The redshift was simply assumed to be due to velocity away from us. By analogy with the Doppler shift of sound, Hubble's law is considered the first observational basis for the expansion of the universe. But ironically, Hubble thought it the least likely explanation. He felt it more likely indicated some new physics. So it was Hubble's professional astronomer assistant, Helton C. Arp, who later proved this to be so. If the redshift is not simply a Doppler effect, Hubble wrote, the region observed appears as a small, homogeneous, but insignificant portion of a universe extended indefinitely both in space and time. Recently and surprisingly, more distant galaxies seem to be accelerating away from us. This discovery won the Nobel Prize and gave rise to the need for huge amounts of mysterious dark energy to power the acceleration. I wrote about that discovery on October the 6th, 2011. The discovery of the acceleration of the expanding universe is an interpretation based on total ignorance of the real nature of stars and the standard candle which was used as the measurement to determine the distance away. So it was gratifying to find support once more in a report this month titled, Could a New Type of Supernova Eliminate Dark Energy? It has been found that the near UV light from the most distant supernovae is brighter than the closer ones. In other words, there's something going on at the atomic and subatomic level. Of course, this is unexpected and unexplained. The diagram on the left shows the difference between the Big Bang universe and the plasma universe. It's easy to see which one is simpler. Intrinsic redshift and uh, Dr. Halton Arp, Hubble's assistant, who was dubbed the modern Galileo, he found redshifts, quasars, physically connected to and in front of, high redshift quasars rather, physically connected to and in front of low redshift active galaxies. This observation of a quasar between the galaxy NGC 7319 and the Earth is impossible if the quasar is over 90 times farther away than the galaxy. So Hubble was right. Something is wrong with physics. Arp showed the redshift happened in small jumps or quanta, which indicates a subatomic effect. But subatomic, these uh, Quantum effects are supposed to only occur at the subatomic level. Here we've got it occurring on the galactic. This requires, once again, the electric force to be operating at ultra-high speed, instantaneously. So quasars are born at high speed and with low redshift. This is ARP's diagram. You see the parent galaxy in the centre. Where are we? That's this one here and the high redshift quasars and the redshift decreases as they move away. Initially their velocity is very high, they are faint, highly redshifted and uh, travelling at a fair fraction of the speed of light. Over time they gain in mass, this is interesting, it means that energy is being supplied to the matter in the quasar and the mass is increasing so that eventually they can actually become a, a turnaround here and become a companion galaxy. This is an example of uh, another path that they can take where you end up with another BL-LAC object as it's called, producing multiple galaxies here. So there is a genealogy, if you like, of galaxies. The idea that the Andromeda galaxy is going to crash into our galaxy in the future is rubbish. It's based on the idea that Andromeda's blue shift with respect to us means that it's approaching us. No, it just means that it's older than us. So the electric universe explains this. Um, 
Quasars are born at high speed and with low mass. They escape the forces of the electromagnetic galactic nucleus, that's the parent galaxy, uh, as neutrons. And because the neutrons have no charge, they can escape the intense electromagnetic um, forces that hold that plasmoid in the center of the galaxy. They have enough time to get away from the, for those powerful forces and then they decompose into electrons and protons which are the forerunners of hydrogen. So as the electrical energy pours into the quasar, its mass and brightness increases and it slows down to become a companion galaxy. So this was an explanation, the only explanation for Halton Arp's observations. Quasars are not the brightest and most distant objects in the universe. They are among the youngest and closest, so they the objects in the mirror really are closer than they appear. The visible universe is smaller than we have been told. So the universe, the real universe, is in balance. It is not expanding. This is important for our understanding of gravity. Gravity cannot be simply an attractive force. The universe is of unknown age and extent. The origin of the universe is unknown. There is a universal now, and space has three physical dimensions. This brings everything back down to, as Tom was pointing out, conditions as we experience it on Earth. Dark matter galaxies. Galaxies are treated as isolated objects in space produced somehow by attractive gravity in an expanding universe. Their rotation and structure remains a mystery. They're made of 80% invisible dark matter. Well, Tom gave a good introduction to that story about dark matter. Dark matter has been described as an invisible elephant in the room. You know it's there by the dent it makes in the floorboards. Dark matter is only inferred theoretically by using our experience of gravity on Earth and projecting it onto the rest of the universe. Once again, it's this geocentric problem. We look at the gravity on Earth and then we just extrapolate outwards because that's all mathematicians can do. It needs an impossible uh, gravitational black hole in the centre. Black holes exist theoretically in asymptotically flat space in an empty universe. You cannot superimpose any other matter in such a hypothetical universe. Black holes don't exist. Yet some sport long, thin, high velocity jets over intergalactic distances there is no satisfactory theoretical explanation for these jets. This is the standard, taking the standard approach. Electric galaxies, on the other hand, plasma cosmology shows experimentally and observationally that galaxies are governed by electromagnetic forces. Tony Pratt said that uh, they introduced gravity into their supercomputer runs and it made no difference whatsoever. Spirals rotate as simple Faraday motors. That's why that curve is flat. It's as if you've got a plate and you're just spinning the plate. Stars are born in and trace the spiral power lines. Where there is a higher density of gas and dust, it's typical of an electrical discharge. Where the density of the material becomes greater, the discharge becomes more filamentary. Stars form along those pinched current filaments. There are no black holes. It's a compact high energy plasmoid and this comes down to peer reviewed um, plasma cosmology. Their apparent mass is due to the relationship between mass and energy. If E equals MC squared, if you've got a high concentration of energy in that tiny plasmoid, it will exhibit a considerable uh, mass. It's certainly not a black hole. The other thing is that galaxies line up actually showing their electrical connectedness because they are threaded like Catherine reels on a wire. And that wire is one of these intergalactic Birkeland current filaments. So let's look at stars. We've done galaxies, let's look at stars. Uh, Eddington, Arthur Eddington, had the temerity to say, it should not be too difficult to understand something as simple as a star. This is typical left hemisphere. <laughs> His quote is typical. 
isolate, simplify and ignore a, and a global view. Because if you look at coronas, sunspots, flares, magnetic cyclones, etc., his gas model doesn't predict any of them. And the alternatives are not explored. He dismisses electrical aspects in a few paragraphs. The failure of this approach is shown by continual complications with each new discovery. It's treated as an isolated, gravitating ball of gas. Conventionally, it's a body that satisfies three conditions. It's made of hydrogen, plus a few impurities. Having a core of the lightest element is the most fanciful assumption. It's needed to allow the thermonuclear energy model to be viable. Uh, that also requires hypothetical extreme conditions in the core. It's only required by the thermonuclear theory and is completely untestable. It also has, I mean, that's unverifiable. And also the sequence of nuclear reactions that take place in the core cannot be verified. They're very complex and requires quantum tunneling, which I referred to earlier. And what's more, there's a more complex, different story for different stars. It's certainly not simple. It's an explosive model because one of the reactions is sensitive to the temperatures of the fifth power. It also needs an unknown radiation zone to break down the X-rays from the nuclear core. There's nobody known that has a radiation or the energy transferred through the body through a radiation zone, so this is hypothetical. And also, from the point of view of life on Earth and so on, it has a restrictive and variable Goldilocks zones distant from the star. It's not the best place to nurture life in the universe. Impossible stars. Formation by gravitational accretion doesn't work. It's never been explained satisfactorily. It has hydrogen, the lightest element in the core. The model doesn't predict the observed features or behaviour. It has different models for white dwarfs, neutron stars, etc. And the life story of stars is super complicated and untestable. And some stars do strange things. They switch from one place to another without going through the transition stages. Renowned scientists like Eddington, who made grave mistakes about the sun and Einstein's general relativity, he went out explicitly to prove Einstein correct, not to test his theory, continue to haunt us today. It gives the lie to the belief that science is self-correcting. It is, or sorry, it is not, given the way in which science is done today. As Eddington said, if there's no other way out, we may have to suppose that bright line spectra in the stars are produced by electric discharges. The clues were there, but what if was not followed through? Herschel reveals a ribbon of future stars. This was reported on March the 30th this year. So this is a very recent picture. Stars and planets are formed by powerful electromagnetic forces like pearls on a cosmic string. This is a quote from an earlier report. Gravity can be ignored. Plasma cosmology, there is no gravitational accretion. There's no way you can form a string like that using gravity. Gravity is a, a central force and the material tends to come into a center. It doesn't form a string. But this recent report says, and this is important, stars are shot out of the filaments by a slingshot mechanism. And there's a diagram here which shows the filaments moving around like those in the plasma ball, you know, where they, they snake about. The stars having been formed in this filament are left behind as the, the filament uh, moves on and these stars are shot out. And it's interesting because uh, Tony Peratt described uh, to us once the effect seen in high energy discharge experiments as these plasmoids scattered like buckshot. Now it's not only stars that are formed here, it's all solid bodies including planets and they may be captured by the stars to form the weird assort assortment over three and a half thousand of them so far of exoplanetary systems that have been observed. New stars also may fission to produce hot Jupiters in very close orbits and achieve electrical stability with their changing electrical environment. The movement of the filaments, as I said, is like those in a plasma ball. 
heavy elements convect into a cool core. This is interesting because these, those blue filaments you saw before are the coldest part of the cloud and this is where the stars are forming. The tra tra traditional view is that the stars had to form by gravitational collapse and not lose any of the heat of the collapse, otherwise they couldn't start their nuclear fires. Well, this doesn't require any of that. It was one of the surprises for theorists uh, is that the, uh, the blue filament I mentioned is the coldest part of the cloud and contains 800 times as much mass as the sun. This is not a surprise for plasma cosmologists. So, all stars have a cool planetary core. Stars and many planets are born together along the same electrical umbilical cord. Other planets and moons are born later in electrical fissioning events and capture events. Hydrogen and helium tend to form the outermost atmosphere. This is a, a diagram showing the actual form of the filaments. You'll notice the pattern there. This is showing an experimental pattern of a discharge on an insulating plate. And this shows a Martian electrical scar. You can see the similarities. As the cosmic lightning bolt fades, stars and planets are captured into planetary systems. So electric stars, they remain a gaseous electric discharge phenomena, like spherical searchlights following their birth. In fact, some of the characteristics of the photosphere is like that of a, um, a searchlight. All bright stars catalytically produce heavy elements in their photospheric plasma discharges. Red stars have gigantic anode sheaths. Sorry, I'll get the right picture there. Plasma discharges adjust to their environment by moving electrical barriers called plasma sheaths or misleadingly magnetospheres because they trap the magnetic fields inside. If Jupiter's plasma sheath were lit up, it would appear the size of the full moon in the sky uh, at opposition. And its Galilean moons would be orbiting comfortably inside it. So red dwarfs are not dwarfs and their bloated glowing anode sheaths are the cosmic wombs for life because inside that radiant red sphere, all satellites receive uniform heat and light over their entire surfaces. And it doesn't matter how they're moving or rotating, that will be the case. Of course, this poses a problem for the SETI project because radio waves cannot penetrate the glowing plasma sheath. So if these are the wombs of uh, life, uh, we don't have any way of radio communication with them. But of course, gravity can pass through. White dwarfs are not dwarfs at all, they're just stars with no bright photosphere and a faint white coronal discharge. These are some of the planetary systems that have been discovered. You can see the, it's uh, quite a shambles. So as I said before, at the galactic scale, electromagnetic forces form these gigantic Birkeland currents and they dominate. At the planetary scale, inside the star's protective plasma sheath, gravity dominates. So you have to choose the region you're talking about when you you're trying to apply your model to stars, galaxies and so on. In fact, the, um, inside the uh, star's protective sheath with gravity dominating, and it dominates because it cannot be electrically shielded. So the impact from all of the other stars in the universe is acting like a pressure in on the, uh, the planets moving around the sun. In fact, this repulsive force from the rest of the universe can reverse the Earth's motion about the sun in six months. That is six sextillion tonnes by 140,000 miles an hour. So that gives you an idea of the impact. Then the thunderbolts of the gods operate to modify masses. Oh, sorry. In planetary systems, the electric force comes into play only when plasma sheaths collide because then the electrical insulation breaks down <coughs> and the electric current flows between the two bodies. Then the thunderbolts of the gods operate to modify masses and change orbits 
and uh, to quickly re-establish order. This is one of the problems that Velikovsky faced. How do you explain uh, events within the memory of mankind of chaos in the solar system and yet it looks like clockwork today? And this is the answer. You have to apply the electric model of gravity to be able to um, do this. So Velikovsky was right. E electricity and magnetism are involved in the celestial mechanism. Changing the surface charge on a planet change modifies the strength of the internal electric dipole which is responsible for the planet's mass and gravity and the changes to, to, to both bodies which I've shown in previous YouTube talks tends to move the two bodies apart which is very convenient. This overcomes the objections of the Harvard book burners to Velikovsky's Worlds in Collision. However it doesn't detract from the title to say that worlds didn't collide it was an electrical clash of the titans. There's uh, Velikovsky with his great book. <laughs> so what we have now in science is a mythical journey. It is a rehash of a creation myth. The earth was born and for four and a half billion years has remained roughly where it is now. Long ago the earth had a few massive impacts to birth the moon and almost wipe out life on earth at intervals. Ironically, planetary collisions have been found essential 66 years after Velikovsky's book, Worlds in Collision, was burned. Thousands of exoplanetary systems don't fit the story. There are stars that shouldn't exist, hot Jupiters that orbit their star in hours or days, backward orbits and polar orbits. Life on Earth remains unexplained. The odds against random events producing life are practically infinite. The rest of the story is once upon a time fragmented, boring and non-predictive. We are an isolated and improbable accident. That's why we have difficulty imagining life elsewhere in the universe. Alan Alder complains, everybody is ignorant about science. Alder was 11 years as host of Scientific American Frontiers on PBS and he helped inspire the creation of the Center for Communicating Science at Stony Brook in 2009. Is it any wonder when this is the face of science today? There is no real meaning or morality in modern mechanistic science to engage students or the public. Everyone thinks it is all mathematics. It saddens me to see so much talent wasted in the pursuit of myth, hunting for dark matter. Their heads have been filled with it. Our real journey are you looking for the nearest exoplanet? We're standing on it. Pay attention to the oldest stories of the celestial gods who created the skies and land we see today. Yoro Yoro is a research book uh, about the Kimberley region, Aborigines in Western Australia. And they some of their stories are so close to the reconstruction of the Saturnian uh, polar configuration that it's almost scary. And these are the words from the elders and they were very precise in their words. It says, in the beginning people saw before the ice age that the moon, sun and some of the stars had been on earth. In other words, they were very close. One song told about a flood long before the last that was brought on by a star with trails. The symbols that testify to these events are still in the Kimberley. The Wanjina creator figure, which is the one you can see on the front of the book there, uh, features are explained. All rings around the head represent clouds and lightning. The big spirit Wanjina have large eyes. This is the eye god motif that Dave Talbot has uh, explained at length. They never have a mouth nor ears and the line between the eyes indicates where the power flows down and it's not a nose and it has it looks like a hollow tube which in the plasma column uh, scenario of the Saturnian story is accurate. Wallen Gander, the creator Wanjina, did not create with his hands only through his voice with power. It reminds me of in the beginning was the word. 
Andy Hall has recently explained that the overpressure from supersonic shock waves, that is from the electrical blasts that strike the surface of a body, are powerful enough to form mountains. Rock flows until the overpressure drops, whereupon it solidifies instantly, but retains an imprint of the shock wave. Those shock waves would have produced harmonics and overtones, a global sound like a symphony of giant trumpets. There's many traditions about the creation being associated with sound. This little book I bought in Central Australia on a visit to uh, Uluru, you know, the, that great red rock which looks just like an asteroid has landed. And uh, it also uh, tells a story by these people in the Kimberleys, but it's illustrated by children and uh, it's very quaint. The story is by David Moel Jale, uh, who's the um, elder. It tells of two suns in the sky who lived in hollow logs, the plasma columns. There is a period of intense heat from them. Then one sun is attacked with a spear, the thunderbolt, and is bitten by a snake, cometary Venus, who lives in the sky. The little sun gets snagged in the fork of a celestial tree, which is the axis mundi, the, the tree of life, the celestial tree. So this is an extension of the forensic technique that Velikovsky introduced. Uh, he never referred to the Australian Aborigines, but some of their uh, memories are s seem to be so accurate that they are a better source than some of the more so-called advanced cultural uh, re reports. All of these story elements make sense to mytho-historians and to the leading plasma cosmologist and colleague of Hans Alfein, Tony Peratt. Accept best evidence regardless of its fit with modern consensus science and man-made theoretical laws. It is better to adopt a forensic science approach to the evidence for past events that cannot be repeated than to rely on theoretical science which is based on sets of beliefs and a geocentric uh, perspective. Use that evidence to develop a more holistic science that brings our phenomenal real journey to light. To be real and useful, science must be holistic. The electric universe is a holistic science that applies seamlessly from the galactic to the earthly to the biosphere and on down to subatomic particles. Humanity's dramatic experience of the electrical nature of celestial mechanics would make an awe-inspiring and frightening IMAX movie that would make science fiction seem a pale shadow in comparison. But in my opinion, once understood, there will be no irrational urge to revisit doomsday upon each other and the Earth under the unrecognised banners of the prehistoric warring planetary gods. Planets bear the scars of their electrical birth and past encounters on their faces. Apollo astronauts commented on the fresh appearance of lunar craters. The event that caused the great gash across the face of Mars appears in stories from ancient cultures. These are just yesterday in geological time. I recommend you see episode two, Symbols of an Alien Sky, the lightning scarred planet Mars. We may understand our history and place in the electric universe for the first time. This is singularly important for our sense of well-being. It gives dramatic new meaning to our lives and a sense of responsibility for our jewel of a planet. Without this sense, we probably have no future on Earth. Also, in the event, myth becomes science. There was a unique myth-making period and all surviving cultures required their stories to be faithfully transmitted for millennia. Such was their importance. We look at these enigmatic rock art figures from the remote Kimberley region in Western Australia and see only their strange, haunting and artistic beauty. And it was rather ironic that just a week or so ago, and David Novak was there to see it too, I think, um, they had the Vivid Festival in Sydney where they project images onto public buildings and of course the Opera House is the, the most public building in Sydney and this was a presentation of Wanjina figures. 
I mean, they are haunting and I think they probably evoke some kind of a subconscious connection. But how much more would they mean if people really understood their origin? We need to give more credit to the indigenous people. Now, Evan Camp said that one of the unique aspects of the Electric Universe theory is that it's good storytelling. It answers all three questions. What if? What if the sky was different in the past? What if Saturn was worshipped as the sun? What if there were electrical discharges between planets? Let's catch up here. What if there were electric discharges between planets? Today we have meteorites from Mars. What if Lichtenberg figures explain the scars on Mars and Earth? Show students pictures of cratering on different bodies and ask students to explain them from two points of view. The standard model needs different explanations for each. Oops, sorry. <laughs> that was unexpected. The electric universe, on the other hand, has a single explanation for them all. Then there is the story of the dissidents. If only Birkeland hadn't been ignored, Hans Alfane had been listened to, Halton Arp's research hadn't been dismissed, a Pixar rule for storytelling number 16, what are the stakes? Give us reasons to support the character. What happens if they don't succeed? Stack the odds against them. What of the future if this goes on? We continue wasting money and careers looking for things that don't exist. We cripple students by not training them to think. We may have no future on this planet. As Evan Camp says, the power of eliciting engagement is to get people to come to their own conclusions. Thinking is going to be the future of education. So, our ele electric universe future. Mahatma Gandhi said, there is a force in the universe which, if we permit it, will flow through us and produce miraculous results. The electric universe is an inspiring story that motivates students both conceptually and artistically and that is what's needed for left and right brain hemisphere development. Education, classical science and the arts, left and right hemispheres. Let's just catch up here. Many principles of the electric universe were foreseen by scholars in the past, Newton, Faraday, etc. A release from existential fear, Velikovsky's The Bonds of the Past, a documentary. There is a collective inability to face the truth that prehistoric mankind faced doomsday. For millennia, science has preached stability and order, but as amnesiacs, we have a compulsion to instinctively repeat the catastrophes of the past, destroying each other and the earth from the sky with apocalyptic weapons, like the planetary gods of old. This was one of Velikovsky's greatest fears. But we have, on the other hand, the possibility of an unparalleled re renaissance with the electric universe, bringing everything together seamlessly. Understanding ourselves and our past can heal the wounds and provide a more universal sense of connection and purpose. Understand the electric force of nature. Power like the sun and gravity. Quantum interactions. All three rely on understanding matter interactions via the instantaneous electric force. Understanding uh, living organisms, the mind-body connection and beyond. Also, understanding the dangers of genetically modified organisms and manufactured food. There is no thought given to the uh, effects, the un unintended consequences of fiddling with these things when our un basic knowledge is so lacking. And the idea 
in an electric universe is to live in tune with the earth and each other. Resonant connection. On the most general level, the electric universe is a new paradigm of universal resonant connection. The arbitrary inertial frames of reference of physics are not equivalent when everything is connected in real time. How and where you are makes a difference to your energy state. For example, the GPS system is supposed to prove relativity theory. It doesn't. The atoms in orbiting clocks have a different energy from identical clocks on Earth. So engineers simply count a different number of ticks to compensate. Time is universal, unchanging and unchangeable. Clocks are not. Think of the relationships between all things connected by the universal electric force and consider that the electric force must act instantly, otherwise no information transfer is possible between resonant tuned systems. Spacecraft using slow speed of light transmissions require constant retuning of receivers on Earth to compensate for their motion. Obviously, living systems could not function if moving parts of the body lost contact with the brain. Acknowledging this simple fact will explain quantum weirdness and open up science, particularly biology, to amazing possibilities that are presently forbidden. And understanding gravity and magnetism as balancing electric forces will change forever our view of the heavens and the earth under our feet. As the morphic resonance experiments of the biologist Rupert Sheldrake have shown, the things that are learnt by one organism are immediately available to others like them anywhere on Earth. The universe learns. Resonance between molecular tuning forks allows instant information transfer, the mind-body connection and beyond. Life is structured water. This was said to me by Gerald Pollack. The experiments, or his experiments, show the structure of electrically polarised water molecules gives rise to water's amazing properties. It allows information to be stored and transferred within a living cell, the memory mechanism of homeopathy. It suggests that the electrically polarizable ether particles may also participate in information storage as well as transmission. The electric universe resonant electrical model of matter and the all pervasive neutrino ether suggests that resonance and structure within structure can store unlimited information and transfer it instantly. There is more to life than meets the eye. We have always known that instinctively. The electric universe suggests that the information needed for life, forget the gene, that's just a factory floor, is universal, so life can take hold wherever conditions arise that allow it. We see evidence for that in the great changes immediately following catastrophic mass extinctions on Earth. We see it in organisms living in anoxic conditions over volcanic vents on the ocean floor and at great depths in rocks. Just as gravity cannot be shielded, since all matter participates in force transfer, so it is with this universal information bank. There are no islands in space. We are earthlings in the complete resonant connection sense, in a meaningful electrical universe. The fact that we exist suggests a purpose, purposeful universe. Our lives have purpose. We don't manifest as a blank slate. So children should be observed and supported in their individual passions, not suppressed and moulded to our desires for them. We are born with a purpose, but many need help to discover that purpose. In answering the question, why are we so unhappy, Ian McGilgrist says, true happiness is based on connections with others and a sense of purpose beyond the immediate. True happiness is one aim of this conference. The new panorama of an amazing shared history and kinship must change the world. In the search for meaning, the electric universe paradigm can, as Ian McGilchrist says, change the world. Elegance, harmony and simplicity of concepts are the electric universe guiding principles. Thank you.